Good evening. I'm the Reverend Terry Kofiel, and welcome to Epworth United Methodist Church as we come together in different locations to celebrate Maundy Thursday. The Reverend Bill Jones, who is also on our staff, will be joining us remotely later. This is a night of remembrance. It was a night of celebration, and together we'll learn a little bit more about its history and what it means to us today. But as we begin to worship, we will worship with our prelude. Please join me in the invitation to grace. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Let us join now in singing one of the great songs of the Exodus, Let My People Go. Why is this night different from all other nights? That is the question that children around the world are asking tonight at the Seder table, because tonight is the second night of the Passover celebration celebrated by our Jewish brothers and sisters. 
It's the same Passover that was celebrated by Jesus as a boy as he grew up to learn the stories of God's redemption of the people in the exodus from Egypt. The table that we have here tonight is a little bit of first century and a little bit of 21st century because the elements have changed through the years, but the meaning remains the same. There is the unleavened bread, now matzah, that you can buy in any grocery store to remember that on the night when God released the captives from Egypt, he told them to eat with their shoes on their feet, their sandals and their staff in their hand, not to take time to let the bread rise, so they made unleavened bread. Also on the table, the bitter herb to remind them of the bitterness of slavery. And with that, in today's celebrations of the Seder meal, a sweet substance made with apples and honey, raisins and cinnamon that reminds them of the mortar that they could not use to make bricks in Egypt. There's also an herb that is sweet, parsley, but it is dipped into salt water to remember the bitter tears of their time in slavery. There's an egg that represents new life and springtime and rebirth. There are four cups of wine and scholars disagree on their historical origins. Some say that they're the four promises of God to redeem God's people, to be their God and have them be God's people. Some say they represent the four letters of the unspoken word for God, Yahweh, which means I am. And then the symbol that means so much, the shank bone of a lamb, the sacrificial lamb, the lamb of the Passover, because God told the people to gather into groups to slaughter a lamb, to paint the blood upon the doors of their houses so that the angel of death would fly over when smiting the firstborn of Egypt. It's a hard story to hear because we're not used to God acting in such harsh ways with people. Why is this night different from every other night? It's because this is the night that God led the people to freedom. And so this is a symbol for people today of the freedom that God brings. The story became an important one, and the song that we just sang was a spiritual, written during the time of the American slave trade, because the story of the exodus and the promise of freedom and liberation was very important to that people at that time. But this night had other significance. Now, scholars debate whether the Passover meal was the one that Jesus celebrated at his last supper with his disciples. Clearly, in John's gospel, it is not, because the meal is really hardly mentioned. And the emphasis is on the timing, because it was the time of the sacrifice. Our invitation to grace tonight, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. The time of Jesus giving his life for our sake and our salvation and our redemption from slavery to sin and to death. And Jesus did something that they did not expect after they had had this meal, whether it was this Passover meal or a meal leading up to it. They would sit at a table low to the floor. They would sit on pillows and recline. They would lean against the table. They didn't sit around it, and they certainly didn't sit like it was painted by Leonardo da Vinci in what we all know as the Last Supper painting. But what were they doing as they sat? They were arguing over who was greatest among them. And Jesus did something astounding. He took off his outer robe and he went to the foot washing basin that would be in every home at that era because people wore sandals and streets and sidewalks were not paved. There were no sidewalks. And so the dust of the day would collect on their feet. And when you came into someone's house, a sign of hospitality and welcome was for the lowest servant in the household or the lowest child in the totem pole, or the one who was the servant to wash feet. And Jesus, in their midst, took off his outer robe, took water, and he poured it into the basin. And as he knelt before Peter to wash his feet, Peter said, no, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus said, unless I wash your feet, 
you have no part of me. And Peter said, then not just my feet, but my hands, my face, my everything. And Jesus laughed, as he often did, and said, Peter, if you've had a bath, you don't need that. But I'm doing this to give you an example of what it is to serve. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And we ask why this is a special night, because we call it Maundy Thursday. The word Maundy means mandate or commandment. And this is the commandment that Jesus gives them. He says, I have a new commandment for you. Love one another. This is how they will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. They didn't know then what it would mean for them as they went forward. They didn't know that this was going to be the last night of his life, the last meal they would share with him. And his last action with them was one of servanthood, of humility. And so now I invite you to join us as we sing in the great hymn of humility. Yezu, Yezu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Why is this night different from all other nights? The disciples had just had this wonderful meal. They had just entered Jerusalem to the cries of Hosanna as their Lord rode in on the foal of a donkey. They had no idea what was ahead of them that night. And so they left that room where they had gathered to share the meal. They left singing and they made their way across the Kidron Valley, not knowing that they were going to the garden the garden of Jesus' arrest, of his anguish, and his suffering. Thank you. 
Our reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 31 to 75. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed. My father, If it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So, could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This fellow said, 
I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard that his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly, you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. We invite you now to sing together, Ah, Holy Jesus.
Why is this Holy Thursday different? Obviously because we are in a nearly empty church. The coronavirus has us all terrified. More and more reports of people in our own community suffering with this dreadful illness. What else is different? No Holy Communion. One of the things that I don't even know that my congregation has learned about me yet is that I am in love with the sacraments of the church. It's how I knew I was called to be an ordained pastor in the church, to be an elder. Because I knew when I heard those words being spoken that they were supposed to come out of my mouth and there is no greater joy in all the ministry for me than to baptize and to celebrate God's presence with us in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, in the bread and the cup. Some folks have asked, why don't we just celebrate remotely? Why don't we just have everyone gather a little bit of bread and some Welch's grape juice at home, or some wine if you're by yourself? Because communion is about community. It's not a magic show. It's not communion because I make it so. It's communion because together when we break that bread and we share together in the cup, we share in all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. We share in his Last Supper. Because like Jews at the Last Supper, like Jews today at the Seder meal, they believe they're sitting at that table. And there's an empty seat always left and a wine cup left to be filled for Elijah when he returns. But tonight we cannot have communion because we cannot be together. And so we have to ask ourselves if Everything is so very different. What is it about this night that is the same? How is it the same? What you see on the screen is a newspaper from 1918. The war was still going on. It had just come to the time where it was about ready to end. The Great War, World War I and the Spanish influenza epidemic swept the country. Churches closed at that time. Schools closed, theaters closed, and people wore masks in the street. So in some ways, this is very familiar territory to some of us. Not that anyone who was alive then would remember that time, because there are people who are still alive, but they were infants or very young children at the time. They didn't have streaming services. They didn't have Zoom and YouTube and Facebook. They didn't even have Netflix. They were at home waiting for news to come and afraid of what the next newspaper might bring. Things change in our lives, don't they? The story of Passover, the story of our Lord at his Last Supper, which for John did not include the Eucharist, the time when Jesus changed what he was doing and said to them, take my body and eat, take my blood and drink. The stories don't change, but we do. We hear them in different situations in our lives and we hear them speak to us differently. How many of us remember the first Christmas or the first Easter holding a new baby for the first time? And if it was your first grandchild, you were really excited. But you also hear the story differently the first time you celebrate these great events or remembrances in the life of the church without the one you love, who has gone on to claim glory. We hear it differently when we're doing well financially. We hear it differently when we're struggling. We hear the story differently at different stages of our lives. But there's something else that remains the same, and that is Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Good Shepherd is also the Lamb. He is the one who took upon himself our sin, our shame, and our guilt, and gave us back salvation. So, as much as things change, it remains the same that we have a Savior who loves us, a Savior who gave his life for us. And so, on this Holy Thursday, I so wish we could be together. I so wish I could share with you the body and blood of Christ along with my faith and my hope in the future and my prayers for an end to this pandemic so that God's people around the world might gather together with joyful and grateful hearts. But until then, remember that we have a Savior who loves us. We 
have a Savior who gave his life for us. We have a Savior who has already been raised for us and who has promised to come again. And for that, I am grateful. And in that, I place my hope and my trust. Let's sing together one last time the song of the Lamb. Let us pray. Holy God, like those Egyptian slaves, our Hebrew ancestors, we wait in anticipation for your salvation. We look to be delivered from today's troubles, so often forgetting that you have brought us to this point by your grace alone, and you are our hope. Oh God, you are our help in ages past. You are our hope for years to come. You are our shelter from the stormy blast. You are our eternal home. And we come to you now in gratitude for the depth of your love shown to us in Jesus Christ. Send us into these holy days as we await his resurrection, filled with the hope that is ours in him. And bless us with your presence now and always until we're together again. May the blessings of God Almighty, who is Father, who is Son, who is Holy Spirit, be with you now and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.